um, to, to get a little more specific about, you know, what are, what are we actually talking about with, with myofascial trigger points? Um, the definition of a myofascial trigger point is a tender node in taut fibrous band of muscle that refers pain elsewhere when stimulated or compressed. Okay, so that's got some overlap with, but it is not the same as um, uh, classical acupuncture points, which many of which are myofascial, uh, which are frequently turn out to be myofascial trigger points and vice versa. But they're not identical. There's overlap, but they're not identical. They're not the same as motor points either. Motor points are where the the motor neuron enters the, the main motor neuron that makes a muscle function enters that muscle belly. Uh, and there's a site that shows increased electrical activity. Sometimes those can also become myofascial trigger points. Sometimes they aren't. There are myofascial trigger points that aren't motor points. Okay, so they're not uh, identical either, but there's some overlap. Um, but they are a lot more than simply a tender area. Okay, squeeze LI4 or liver 3 on most people, they will report that it's tender. Doesn't mean it's a myofascial trigger point. Okay, um, because uh, if it's so again, what we're looking for is that tender node, uh, what a patient will often describe as a knot, um, uh, a granulated or fibrous uh, uh, lump in a taut fibrous band of muscle tissue that when you push on it, the patient will exper experience more widespread pain rather than just local tenderness. That does have an awful lot of overlap, I believe, with a, correct, with a proper interpretation or understanding of what asher means, which is not just tenderness. Asher is best translated as, that's it, I found it. I found the key location that when I press on it, it reproduces the patient's typical symptoms. And that's really what the bullseye of what we're looking for with myofascial trigger points as well. Okay. <clears throat> so they do play a significant role in symptoms and disability. Um, the musculoskeletal system consumes is about 80% of the body weight and consumes about 80% of its caloric resources, more or less. Um, and so what goes on in our muscles affects everything else very significantly. And they have the orphan child, the orphan stepchild of, uh, of Western medicine. There's no profession of, there's no board specialty of myology that devotes itself specifically to muscles. And <clears throat> um, in my master's level training, they were kind of given short shrift as well. We spent maybe an hour or two on the, the, uh, <clears throat> the jing jin, the sinew meridians or sinew um, or sinew channels as they were translated in the textbooks that we used. Um, we got a little bit of instruction, but not much, okay? And yet they are almost ubiquitous. Basically any adult uh, is going to have a number of myofascial trigger points. They start forming basically with upright posture. Even children have myofascial trigger points. Um, and they become more and more chronic and more significant and more disabling with age unless we treat them. Um, so there are primary myofascial trigger points that, that <clears throat> come into being on their own from muscle overloading and also psychosocial stress. Um, and then there are also secondary trigger points that form as a result of uh, injuries uh, to our joints, to our nervous system, to our organs, or, or to diseases of various sorts. Okay. Um, and what can ha either way, what happens with myofascial trigger form uh, trigger points once they become formed uh, is they start to bombard our central nervous system with pain signals, and that can lower pain thresholds and lower pain tolerance globally, so that a very painful myofascial trigger point in someone's quadriceps can make them start feeling what would otherwise be mild or latent or you know not troublesome sensations elsewhere in their body. Okay. They are often underdiagnosed and undertreated and may, mis may, may be mistaken for other conditions, uh, sprain strains, bursitis, arthritis, tendonitis, neuritis, etc. Okay. So <clears throat> I think much of this I've already talked about, and I'm just going to add a few things here. They, they are a clinically significant subset of tender areas and muscles, um, and some of them really can only be accessed by effectively by needles. Um, there are some muscles, quadratus lumborum, very difficult to release manually, to do anything effective with hands alone or with gua sha or, or cupping, way too deep. And yet with a needle, we can safely and very effectively get into this very deep muscle in the low back and do a lot of good. And I've had uh, more than one patient who has, uh, you know, their MRIs look okay, the physicians can't find what's wrong, they shrug their shoulders, doesn't look like a disc injury or a facet joint problem or spinal stenosis or nerve damage but they've got severe unremitting low back pain and needling into the quadratus lumborum relieves it significantly. So, um, 
So some of the benefits that come out of myofascial trigger point needling for a patient is getting lasting muscle relaxation and relief of local pain um, and restore muscle length and strength and elasticity and function. Uh, improve blood flow. There are very interesting studies coming out of the myofascial trigger point world that, conf that are consistent with what we've known for thousands of years in Chinese medicine that um, pain inhibits blood flow and, and inhibited blo blood flow causes pain. And when you reduce a trigger point effectively, blood starts to flow again. This is observable in ultrasound studies. Um, we get restored biomechanics, uh, improved joint function, um, improved efficiency and comfort in posture, ergonomics, sports activities, etc. And, and then, as I said, a, a global re reduction in pain, or to put it differently, a global increase in, in, uh, in, in pain tolerance and pain thresholds simply by reducing even a local myofascial trigger point. In the big picture, by reducing myofascial trigger points, we're moving qi and blood, both locally and globally. Okay. So one way of, of, that I like to, to, um, to look at this um, in terms of my, my own sort of experience of it, um, uh, I, I love to backpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains near my home in uh, coastal California. And the analogy occurred to me that what I learned in acupuncture school was time-tested trails, well-established trails that get you, you can rely on them to get you where you want to go uh, most of the time with good results for many patients and conditions. They're relatively easy to follow and to teach and to learn and perform, etc. Um, but this is more for those of us that have been trained as acupuncturists, myofascial trigger point needling, we're going to be journeying cross-country. And that can get us to unfamiliar destinations that we wouldn't otherwise see, uh, opens up new treatment options to treat conditions that weren't responding to, to um, traditional classical acupuncture techniques. But just like cross-country backpacking and going into the high country, there are some additional skills and safety training that we need. Uh, and some additional experience that we need to be able to, to perform it safely and get to where we want to go. Okay? Um, but we may already be doing it inadvertently. Um, and I certainly had this experience before I, I got sufficiently trained in myofascial trigger point needling, and many, maybe many of you have had too, where you were needling into a classical acupuncture point, and suddenly you got this really strong twitch or jump where the patient's muscle contracted. They may have yelped or you know, jumped off the table and, you know, and said, oh, I'll take that out. And I remember have, having one patient who got furious with me and was you know, accusing me of being incompetent and you know, stormed out of the clinic. And I mean, he had some other issues going on, but it was like, wow, okay, I, you know, I put a needle in large intestine 11 and did my little you know, uh, twirl manipulation and lift and thrust. And he got this enormous twitch response out of a, a huge trigger point that, in his forearm. And, and with adequate training, I would have been able to contextualize that for him and reframe it for him as like, wow, you've got a huge trigger point in your supinator or in your brachioradialis, and I just released it. That's great. This is therapeutic. I know it's super uncomfortable, and your arm is going to be sore and stiff and achy for maybe a day or two. But trust me, it's going to feel a lot better afterwards, and it's going to function better afterwards. This particular patient, I don't know if that would have made the difference, but that's what I do now with my patients. So you may, so if you've had that experience, it's not that you've done something wrong; it's that that you've needled into a trigger point. Okay, um, but and also if you are selecting where to needle on the basis of muscular structure or function, uh, and needling into tender locations, you're doing trigger point needling. Um, so 